Hello. Nobody's on yet. <laughs> yeah, but the playback will say hello. <laughs> hello. Hello. <laughs> Waiting on you to join us. Oh, three people are on. Hello. Hi, Vicki. Chris is on. Hello, Pastor Chris. Good evening. Sister Vicki, thank you for joining us. Brother Hi, Jeff. Jeff. Hey. And as uh, people are joining, we're so so thankful for everyone who has been <clears throat> so good about it. It's Crystal. It's been great to see uh, people connecting with us. Good to see you, Donna. Hope the Pell family is doing well and been praying for you and your family. Yes. And uh, so thank you all. Thank you for everyone who's continued to join us uh, on Wednesday evenings. Brother Jim, good to see you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Good to see you. Sister Donna, good evening to you as well. Uh, we are just, uh, and Tim Mayo is still in Florida, having a tough time. <laughs> Tim, I hope you're getting in some golfing while you're there. And good to see Nin Nina from Whitfield. Good to see you, Nina. Thank you for joining us as well tonight. And hello to you and everyone there in Whitfield. And we are uh, going to be looking at Luke chapter 15, a very familiar passage, I think, to many of us tonight. But we're going to just spend some time reflecting on, uh, uh, we're going to refer to three of the parables. How you doing, Melanie? Good to see you. Thank you. And Brother Brad as well. Uh, and uh, well, we're going to look at some parables tonight. Uh, but mainly we're going to focus on the parable of the prodigal son. So it's a very familiar passage, but we're going to reflect and share tonight from that. Uh, so uh, we'll begin here and just, I thought I'd give it a couple minutes. We do have, uh, just while everybody's tuning in, I know you, some of you, if you've not watched Pastor Melvin, good to see you as well. Uh, for those who are not aware, we are uh, moving forward this coming Sunday. Uh, the governor has opened with phase one, so we will be having a our service uh, this coming Sunday at 10.30 a.m., We've been busy this week uh, making sure we plan to meet all the necessary uh, uh, specifications the governor has requested. Uh, we have been busy. I've, in fact, today I was marking pews, uh, putting green tape on areas where we will maintain social distancing. And uh, so we thought we'd go with green tape to keep with our KC colors. So green is gonna mean good for seating. Uh, we've, we've taken some other measures in place. You'll hear more information about that later this week, and I'll probably uh, remind everyone again after the at the end of the today's uh, broadcast. Uh, Dad, thank you for joining us as well. So we're going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to begin with prayer, and then uh, Crystal and I both will be sharing and just sharing our thoughts. And we invite you to uh, share a prayer request. If you have uh, any prayer requests, you can feel free to share those. Uh, and uh, we'll open up with prayer, and then we're going to look at Scripture tonight. So if you want to get your Bibles ready, turning to Luke chapter 15, and then uh, we'll have a time of discussion, and then I'll share some more about our reopening uh, this coming Sunday, and then we'll have prayer again. Uh, but let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer, and let's ask for His blessing and His anointing, and for Him to speak to our hearts tonight. Uh, and again, thank you for those who are joining, uh, those who will be joining, and those who will be viewing later. We appreciate so much you taking the yes. time uh, to look at the video, uh, especially those who look at the video more than 30 seconds. So we're, we're glad you're sticking with us. <laughs> so let's just take some time and uh, focus together on God's Word and reflect together and have a conversation. So, uh, Crystal, you want to open us up in prayer, and then uh, we'll begin our time together. God, we thank you for this opportunity we have today, and we thank you for the gift of today. We thank you for this, this day that you've given us. Every day is a gift, and we don't want to waste that, God. We want to spend it the way that you have, in, have indeed intended us to. We want to live for you and love you and serve you, so we celebrate this day and the gift that it is. And God, we pray that you would bless our time together. Please anoint this Bible study and use it. Please help us to read what might be a familiar story, but to learn something new from it, God. Something that will, will spark our hearts and our minds. Something that will make us draw closer to you, God. 
Please bless our time together. Please bless each person who is watching, whether they're watching live or watching later. I ask you to bless them and take care of the things that are concerning them. Your word says you will perfect that which concerns us. So God, we give all those needs to you and we trust you to provide every day for what we need. God, we love you, we praise you, and we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Well, Crystal, I know tonight uh, we're not going to really focus on the first two parables of Luke 15. At least I don't think we are. <clears throat> but I do want to draw everyone's attention. Hey, Mary, glad you've joined us. And Ronald Roten as well. I'm glad you're with us tonight again as well. Um, but uh, I think it's important to note that in the first 10 verses of Luke chapter 15, there's two different parables that Christ shares. And both of them have sort of similar messages. Uh, the first is uh, in verses 1 through 7, uh, there is the parable of, what's the parable of? The lost sheep. The lost sheep. I'm sorry. My mind has gone <laughs> in a million thought. different directions today. The lost thought. Uh, but basically Christ is talking about if you have a hundred sheep and one is missing, how you go after the one that's missing and uh, how heaven rejoices uh, when one sinner who repents uh, it comes to Christ. And then you have in verse 8 through 10 a very short parable, but it's the parable of the lost coin and sort of a similar message. Uh, you have the woman who's who has 10 silver coins, and if she's lost one, how uh, heaven rejoices and she rejoices and she tells her friends uh, over the lost coin that's been found. And so it's almost like those two parables preface uh, the parable of the prodigal son. And before I read the scripture, uh, you know, we, we basically know the Three, there's really three main characters, I guess, we would assign to the prodigal son. There's the prodigal son, there's the his brother, and there's the father. And we we sort of, as we read through that parable, we, we find ourselves gaining, I guess, sometimes we identify as the prodigal son. I know uh, most of us probably would say, whether it's now or previously, at a time in our life, we really identify with the prodigal son. Uh, but I say there's probably folks uh, out there that a lot of us times we identify with the, with the other son uh, who uh, stayed in the household. And then it's interesting as I, I get older, I, I start to identify more with the father and uh, the father's perspective and how he deals with his sons. You know, one common, I think, thing before we even read it, take away is is the love the father has for his sons, uh, no matter what position in life they are at. Um, I, I think about the father and, and what the father must have went through, um, especially when his son who received his inheritance had left. And uh, I'm sure there were times where the, where the father spent countless nights, days praying, wondering where's my son, praying for his son to come home. Uh, so let's, uh, hey, Brother Phil and Sister D, uh, it's good to see y'all as well. So, uh, but we're going to, I want to focus, we're going to start reading with verse 11. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to read out the New American Standard tonight. And then I'm going to share, my crystal's going to share, uh, and uh, we want you to feel free in sharing. Uh, in the midst of all this, we are going to try to monitor comments uh, so that we include what you want to share with us as well. So, Let's begin reading with verse 11, and I'm going to read a little bit, and then I'm going to share some thoughts as we go through this. So beginning with verse 11, it says, And he said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Verse 14 says, Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. Now it's sort of interesting as we think about, especially that spot where it says a severe famine occurred, and I just jotted down in my notes here, especially in verse 14, it's like everything that was going well for the son, he, he, he received his inheritance, and you know he's excited. He's, he's probably at an age in his life where he wants to see the world and experience life. So he leaves and takes his inheritance with him. And he's just experiencing life. 
And then in verse 14, I mean, it's just a matter of three verses, just a short period of time uh, after all that loose living that happens in verse 13. Notice what happens. It's like everything hits the ceiling. Everything that could go wrong does go wrong. Uh, there's three different things that happens there. He's spent everything he has. So all of his uh, inheritance is gone. And at the same time, a severe famine has occurred. Uh, and then we see uh, that very quickly he became impoverished. So everything that could go wrong went wrong. And he finds himself then in verse 15 uh, in a situation where uh, I'm sure employment, because a famine has occurred, it's hard to find food. It's hard to find uh, the things he needs. I think we all sort of understand what that's like. Uh, you, when you go to the grocery stores, there are entire rows, entire aisles of groceries that sometimes are totally gone. Uh, so in verse 15, the son does uh, something here that uh, he never thought or imagined he would have to do. Verse 15, it says, So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. And look at verse 16, the, the state that this young son finds himself from someone who has received and used to live and, for all we know, always had what he needed provided for him, received his inheritance, has spent everything he has, and now is impoverished. He finds himself in a place in life where in verse 16 it says, And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. So in other words, the very hogs that he is feeding, he would gladly feed himself and eat. In the country we call it pig slop. Uh, pig slop was basically, uh, I remember on my grandmother's farm, Grandmother had a five-gallon bucket that she kept in the kitchen, and she would take all the food that was left over or uh, scraps and put it in the bucket, and it was called the slop bucket. And whether it was at the end of that day or two days later or three days later, whenever that bucket would fill up, my grandmother or whoever, granddad, whoever, would take the slop bucket out to the field behind the farmhouse and put it in the trough, for the pigs to eat. It was the kind of food that none of us, it, it was all food that was rejected or left over, uh, probably close to spoiled. Basically, it's the kind of food that no one wants to eat. I would never imagine myself, I was never, I was never tempted. Every time I visited grandmother's house, I was never tempted to look and see what's in the slop bucket. Uh, I was never tempted to go and uh, find myself with the hogs eating out of the slop bucket. It was never a temptation, never dealt with that. And that's where the young man is at. He's actually at the place, and imagine that. You know, it reminds us how blessed we are. And it also reminds us that we need to, I'm just thinking out loud here, what a place to find ourselves in where we're willing to eat out of the slop bucket to find ourselves in a place where we would gladly just join right there with the hogs eating out of the trough. Now, physically, that's a pretty difficult place to imagine ourselves. and It's a very difficult place to see others in our, and there are people in our society, Crystal, that you know, are a place uh, in life where economically and they're impoverished and that's sobering to us it should be sobering to us but I think about this spiritually now because we know this story is not just about the physical situation of the son but the spiritual condition as well uh, before I go on Crystal is there anything you want to share I know you have a lot of notes here so uh, <laughs> any thoughts you want to share so far well um, if you look back at the beginning of the story he's the younger son Mm -hmm. And we know in that culture, the older son really had the positions of prestige and authority in the home. Mm -hmm. So this younger son, he asks for his share. And he hasn't earned any of what he's asking for. And you think about him asking for it and then packing up everything he has and leaving. 
He asked for that, in my opinion, with a plan. His plan was to leave the parental authority. He had planned to step out. And so, because he takes everything, he doesn't just pack a few things and go on a temporary trip. Mm -hmm. The Bible clearly says he took everything with him. So he is stepping out from under the authority of his father, the rules, and the way things are done at home. And he's going out and doing it his way. And he's asking for his share. Now, by asking for his share, he only gets that amount. Now, the estate will continue to grow as decades pass. But by asking for his share, he's, his part will not continue to grow. The older brother's share will grow and grow and grow. So it's like he's settling for less he's than settling what the for father less. intended for yes, him. Yes, he's definitely settling for less. I mean, if you had $100,000 and I said, I want my half now and I get my $50,000... And then you you can you continue to be prosperous and you continue to be blessed, then the other fifty will turn into sixty, seventy, eighty, and all I'll ever have was half of the original amount. It's not a smart choice, but his desire to go out and do things his own way and be independent, and I think break from the rules, mm -hmm. stifles what he could have had. He settles for less. Wow. than what the Father ever intended for him to That's have. That's powerful. Because we do, how many, and how many times do we do that in life? We settle for less than what, and it's not really a, this is not really a, it's a, not about uh, prosperity preaching, I guess. You know, oh, no, it, it's, it's about, it's about what, settling for less than what God intends for us in absolutely. life. Absolutely. Not, not, not the physical, the spiritual. How many times have we, gone away from God and experienced life and experienced the, the pains and hurts of life when if we could just stay close with the Father, we could experience all that God wants and intends to give us. That's right. Anytime we leave the Father, we're settling for less. Yeah. Wow. And right up front, I mean, we're already, it's not a good deal. Mm. And so I think that's really interesting that, you know, that he's willing to settle for less. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you talked about him being impoverished. Mm-hmm. You know, when I teach about parables, you know, and a lot of times they'll say, no, what is a parable? What, why did Jesus teach in parables? And I always say it's an earthly story with a mm -hmm. heavenly meaning. Yes. So when we look at the word impoverished, that's impoverished in so many ways. Mm -hmm. To be impoverished is to not have what you need. So when we leave the Father, if we step away from God, then we're spiritually impoverished. Mm -hmm. And we find ourselves emotionally impoverished. And pretty much in every aspect of our life, we are impoverished. We are doing without what we need. And so I think that's an interesting word that was chosen there, impoverished. Um, and then I wanted to talk about the fact that he's feeding the swine. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is, this is a Jewish family. Mm -hmm. And he's out doing something that he finds disgusting. I mean, you talked about the slop, and that was gross enough. But to think if you religiously have been taught that pigs are nasty, dirty animals, not to eat them, not to care for them, then he ha finds himself doing about the worst thing he could ever imagine just to survive. And what was it Pastor Underwood used to say? Sin will take you further than you want to mm -hmm. go and cost you more than you wanted to pay. And so that's where he finds himself. He finds himself doing things he never, never ever intended to have to do. Yes. And he's also, well, he's under the control of someone else now. Yeah. He's not really independent. He's now a hired man. And they're not giving him anything at all. No, they're not taking yeah. care of him. They're not providing for him like his father did because he's just a hired hand now. He's not a son. And you really sort of see what the enemy does to our life when we separate ourselves from God is, you know, uh, there, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's the slop. Yep. And, and we see, so when you look, let's look at, uh, back at these verses, we'll continue on. Uh, verse 16 and 17 and 18, he basically comes to his senses. And let me just read those uh, he used to pick it back, back up with verse 16. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But verse 17, 
But when he came to his senses, he said this, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger? And then in verse 18, when he comes to his senses, he makes a decision. At this lowest point of his life, he decides that I'm going to change. I'm going to change my direction. I'm going to change my position. Uh, I'm going to get up from this place and I'm going to go back to my father's house. And we see that. He says, 18, he says, I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. I think it's interesting that in that place, he comes to his senses, he makes up, and it's like he, he comes up with, what do I say to my father? What, what is the best course to take? And he starts to process and uh, work out, well, what, what am I going to say when I, when I get back to my father's house? And uh, before, we can read the rest of that, but anything else you want to add to that part right there before we go on? Well, right now he's at the intention phase. Mm-hmm. And so we'll read on as his intentions become his actions, but he's finally in his intentions taking right steps. He's realizing that he needs to repent. Mm -hmm. And he's realizing that, I think, appreciation of his father. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did not appreciate what he had before, but now that he doesn't have it, he's beginning to have gratitude and gratefulness. And So I think that repentance is a huge part of it, that he realizes he has done wrong. He's not just physically hungry. He's hungry on the inside. Mm -hmm. He realizes that he needs forgiveness. He realizes that he needs healing inside, not just food in his gut, but he needs to be made right with with his father. And that's an important point, I think, to reflect on is that we've all been in situations in life, places in life where we by the power of the Holy Spirit, will realize things are not good and I want it to be different. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's those places that I'm so thankful for the grace of God. Amen. Uh, We should all be thankful for the grace of God where he brings us to our senses and we realize, hey, this is not headed in a good direction uh, and uh, we we realize we've we've got to make a change. And so let's look at what he does. in verse 20, he got up, he came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, and look at this, this is part of the beautiful part of this story, I think, uh, and we see here now the situation of the father, or the position of the father. Obviously, just from what we're getting ready to read, we see that the father has been, his thoughts, his mind, his heart has been for his son who is gone who has left. He's been looking for him because as the sun is coming and headed, he's now he's taking action. He's headed home. But look what happens before he gets home, before he knocks on the door, if you will, or goes through the gates. The Bible says, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. So let's look, Crystal, a little bit about that. Share with us uh, some of what you have in your notes there, and uh, let's just meditate on that, just the, the position of the father and, and this already this reunion that is taking place before they even get to the home, uh, what is taking place here. Well, the father's a busy man. He's running an estate, and he's taking care of, of everything. Mm-hmm. So for him to see the son before he gets there, you can't help but wonder, was he looking for him? Mm-hmm. Was he every day longing and looking out to see, is today the day? Will I ever see my son again? I mean, they, de- they didn't have the abilities we have to communicate, though you're far away. So to him, he had not communicated at all with his son since his son left. So for him to see him a long way off, I feel like he was looking for him. And so he, he has compassion for him, and he runs to him, and he hugs him, and he kisses him. So when this son that has done so much wrong comes into the father's sight, he's met with two things. He's met with unconditional love Mm. and total acceptance. That's powerful. The father doesn't put his hand on his hip and read him the riot act. He embraces him, dirty, stinky, and all. 
He doesn't say, go take a shower and then we'll have a talk. He embraces him and kisses him. And you know just from the story that he was filthy yep. and stinky. Yeah. And so before the son even has a chance to say, I'm sorry, this love is being poured out on him. It's amazing. Yeah. It really is powerful. Most, probably the most powerful part of the story. And I think about, so we see there two positions, the situation of the prodigal son and the situation of the father. And that really motivates us as dads of how we should, uh, the, the heart we should have for our children. Yes. Uh, and it also motivates us as children uh, to be reminded of the Father's love. Mm -hmm. That God is looking for you. God sees you even if you find yourself in the lowest place of life. God is looking for you. And when you, even, even at those beginning stages when you intend, and not just intend, but start to take action and turn back to the Father, can I tell you, our Heavenly Father is looking for you. Amen. That's and right. And He is wanting and willing and ready uh, to run and embrace you welcome you back into his fold into his to a relationship with the father it's right. it's so powerful so let's look what happens then so it's the father and the son they're embracing and the father is kissing his son and look at verse 21 now the interaction of the son the son said to him father i have sinned against heaven and in your sight and look the prodigal son he says i am no longer worthy to be called your son isn't that true of we see the self-condemnation of the son and the position the son now views himself mm -hmm. uh, no longer being willing willing to be called a son or feeling like I, I don't deserve this. And I, I think we all probably understand how that feels, uh, Sister Crystal, is those times in life where we don't feel like we deserve anything. Uh, we don't feel like we deserve forgiveness. We don't feel like we deserve God's love and compassion. So share, share with us your thoughts and what you have. Well, worthy is a trip-up word. Mm -hmm. It's really a trip-up word for all of us because none of us are or ever will be worthy. I wrote in my notes that um, worthy is based on your do, not your who. Mm -hmm. And so worthy is about how you perform. And we'll never, ever be worthy. That's the whole point of why Jesus died for us. So this situation... The boy is in, the son is embraced not because of what he's done, but because of who he is. He belongs to the father. It's not about his actions. And so I think that's powerful. We can't get caught up in our worthiness because we might as well just throw that down like a hot potato because we're never going to be worthy. And at the same time, we can need to stop trying to hold other people up to that too mm -hmm. because other people are not going to be worthy either. People are going to disappoint us, and we're going to disappoint them. Whether it's parents to children, or husband and wife, or friendships, we're all going to disappoint each other. But we have to realize that just as they're unworthy, we're unworthy. So that's where grace comes in. We just have to share yeah. that, spread it thick yeah. for I everyone. I think about that scripture, too, that reminds us that our righteousness is as filthy rags. Mm -hmm. And I won't go into discussion about what that means, but... It reminds us that just, you know, there's places in life where we think we're worthy and we think, well, we've got it all straightened out. Uh, the Bible compares that to our, our righteousness as his filthy rags. Uh, thank yes. God for his grace. Thank God for um, his love, his unconditional love. Uh, so let's look a little bit, let's, let's continue on. Because we see some significant things take place here in the next verse. So after the son... It says, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Uh, immediately, the father takes action. His father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Now, there's three things that are significant here, uh, Crystal, that the father takes action to restore the son. Uh, three, those three things are one, uh, referring to the best robe. He doesn't Notice he, and I haven't done a lot of research on this part of it, but it doesn't say bring a servant's robe or bring a, um, a humble robe. He says the best robe and mm -hmm. put it on him. And then there's also a very significant thing here as well because he says, and put a ring on his hand. That is significant. And then he says, put sandals on his feet. Now, 
what that indicates to us is obviously the son was barefooted. He lost even his shoes. But three significant things there, and I want you to speak to those, uh, of the restoration the father brings about for his son, the bring, putting the best robe and the ring and the sandals on his feet. Well, the robe, the best robe, covers over his filthiness. Mm -hmm. It covers over his dirt, his stink, his sin. And so it's like when we're clothed with, with Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, it, Christ covers our filth, our stink, and our sin with his righteousness. He is the best that heaven has to offer. Mm -hmm. And so that robe that covered this son is like the righteousness of Christ that covers us. We'll never be worthy. And he doesn't say, go scrub him down and then put the best robe on him. It's an immediate thing. And so when we accept Christ, it is an immediate thing that his righteousness covers our sin. Amen. It's so powerful. And, and the idea of the ring on his hand, you know, a ring was a symbol of your family. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you were a member of a family, you would wear the family crest or the family ring. And it's a symbol of the authority. Now, this is cool. The authority of that family. So if you were out anywhere and you were wearing the ring as a son, you had the authority that your whole family had, sort of like your last name. Mm -hmm. Sort of like if you were a Rockefeller or someone with some powerful name in our society, that you would automatically have that authority. So the son is all automatically reinstated into the family. Mm -hmm. And everywhere he goes, he has that authority. And we're told that we have the authority of our father Amen. when we face the enemy, when we deal with a weakness, when we face temptation, that we have that authority. And we are accepted as family immediately when we accept Christ. And I thought this was cool about the sandals. You're right, he was barefoot when he got there. Mm -hmm. But putting sandals on his feet marked him no longer as a slave, but as a son. Because slaves were barefooted and sons were sandals. So he comes to his father saying, just make me a slave, just make me a hired man, I'm not worthy of being your son, but by putting sandals on his feet, he is saying, you're not marked as a slave. You're my son. Mm -hmm. And that's an automatic distinction. And he's lived as a slave, right? Mm -hmm. When he was out wasting his money, and the verse goes on to say it was some pretty bad ways he was wasting it, he really was a slave to others. Mm -hmm. Like, you'll be a, you, will, you will serve someone. The son never really was independent. He went from obeying his father to obeying his own lusts, and then obeying some other man when he was a slave. So when he came back home was when he was really set free and made a son again. So that's pretty cool about the sandals. Cool. Absolutely. Yes. So let's look on, because it, it doesn't even stop there. So uh, the next verse then says, And the father said, And bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. Now I can't help but think about heaven and how when... Uh, you and I, when we made a decision for all of those viewing with us, you know, go back to the time when you accepted Christ. Can I tell you heaven celebrated? Mm -hmm. And imagine the joy. Imagine the joy the Father must have been experiencing in his heart. Uh, I remember Pastor Underwood sharing, uh, and I, I know the Underwoods, I think, are watching right now. But it seems like I remember Pastor Underwood sharing about his own father, and how at a time when Pastor Inwood's brother had ran away and how he would hear his father out praying every night as he would walk the backyard going back and forth, uh, Pastor Inwood would pray, or Pastor Inwood's father would pray, God, where's my son? Bring my son back home. And talked about the, that moment of joy when his son came back home and there was restoration and uh, I never forget hearing Pastor Underwood share with that and how it struck a chord in my heart and life. If, and, and I think the point was, was made here as well. The joy the Father and heaven experiences when you, when we come to that place in life where we return to the Father, experience the Father's covering, His cleansing, His restoring, that right relationship that God has already made uh, has provided for us, it makes heaven celebrate. What a wonderful thought. What a beautiful thought. And that's what's going on here. Uh, the father says, hey, we're going to have a feast. We are going to celebrate because my son that was lost is returned. That's exactly what heaven, the Bible says the angels rejoice when one lost sinner comes to repentance. Just like 
the lost sheep that was found, just like the lost coin That's right. that was found. Heaven rejoices. Uh, angels rejoice. God rejoices. Scripture tells us that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And then we need to find about uh, anything you want to share before we go on to, the, to yeah. see about the other son? Okay. So what happens then? So the verse 25 says, Now the older son, he's in the field. I'm sorry, did I miss a verse? Oh, okay. uh, I'm sorry. Verse 24. Uh, so as they're celebrating, the reason they're celebrating, and the father says, For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and he has been found. And they began to celebrate. So they had a big time of celebration. But let's look at what the, now we find the older son and his reaction. Uh, now his older son's in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard the music and the dancing. In other words, he heard the party going on. He heard everybody celebrating. In verse 26, and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And the servant said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound and then look at the reaction of the older brother mm -hmm. and I think we all can understand the reaction um, the brother becomes angry gets upset doesn't he the Bible says in verse 28 the son became angry and didn't even want to go in didn't want to have anything to do with the party didn't want to see his brother he is upset in ministry, we call this a domestic situation. Uh, it's when uh, feelings are strong, uh, reason has gone out the window, uh, and the reactions are taking place. Can I add something there? You go right ahead. Go right ahead. Um, earlier in the book of Luke, just a couple chapters before, maybe even just one or two, um, Jesus talks about the man who invited the guests to come in to the house, to the mm -hmm. wedding party. Mm -hmm. And now the ones he invited wouldn't come in. They all made excuses. And then he went out and took whoever he could get to come in. So when I think about the son refusing to come in, mm -hmm. refusing to join the party, that's dangerous territory. Mm -hmm. Unforgiveness can inhibit our ability to join in. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the Bible says that we should forgive others as we've been forgiven. So the unforgiveness of this brother really is pretty jeopardizing for him at this moment mm -hmm. because he's not, he's choosing out of unforgiveness not mm -hmm. to join in the party that the father is throwing. That, that, if you, if you compare it with a few chapters before, that really gives it sort of a more of a serious feeling. Yeah. He's missing out on the steak sandwich, the chocolate <laughs> cake, all the celebration. Uh, and it's a lesson to us, a reminder of what, un like you said, what unforgiveness can do. You miss out as well. You're just robbing yourself when you can't forgive, when you can't uh, say, you know what, it is what it is and move on. Uh, so let's look what happens then. Notice that the same father who saw his prodigal son, the same father who restored this prodigal son, makes, uh, look what he does. In verse 28, it says, And his father came out and began pleading with him. And then we see again the reaction of the son, verse 29. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours, and yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, and notice he doesn't refer to him as my brother. That's right. He says, This son, this is like he's. <laughs> He's totally uh, choosing to say, I'm not even going to claim this guy's my brother. And there's probably a whole lot of different directions we could take mm -hmm. that. But yeah. he, he obviously refers to him more of uh, your son, not my brother. Mm. He says, when this son of yours came, he, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes. I mean, this is definitely a domestic situation. This is, father. It's, like, it's almost like he's wanting to remind the dad how bad his son has been. And then it's, bring, and just it's like the, he's re the reminding him of, of the his worst. Rebellion. It's, yeah. He's really exposing that mm -hmm. this was about more than just going out and wasting money. This was about living a sinful yeah. life. Yes. Yeah. And then he, he says, and you killed the fattened calf for him? So 
before we move on, before we read any more, just think of just, just pause and let's think about that. The, the the I guess the emotional, mental state of the older son. He's mad, he's angry, he's jealous, he's unforgiving, he's uncompassionate, and he he is uh, he's having a difficult time. I think he sees the acceptance of the other brother mm -hmm. as a diminishing of his own good living, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Yeah. So the fact that the other brother could go and do all those terrible things and then be accepted, it's like it takes away the value of the faithfulness and the loyalty and the hard work of the older brother. But it doesn't do that at all. But he feels that way mm -hmm. because he's seeing it through a lens of, of a me focus. Yeah. Well, let's look at what happens because I think this is a beautiful ending to this story. So the son, or the, I'm sorry, the father now turns to the son in verse 31. And he says, son, you have always been with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice for this. And then look what the father reminds the son of. For this brother of yours mm -hmm. was dead and has begun to live. He was lost and he has been found. The father is reminding the brother that not only is my son, he's your brother. He's your kin, your uh, familial relationship. And he reminds the son, he's like, it's like he, he's not unacknowledging the bad that he's done, but it's like he's marrying the two together. He's like, yeah, he was bad, but he was dead, but he's begun to live. He was lost, but he's been found. In other words, the father sees the, the totality of the son. He, he measures him not by how his actions were bad and just looking at one point of his life, but he looks at the whole. And I think that's a stark reminder to us that God, thank, thank the Lord, he doesn't just focus on the bad that we've done. But God, God looks at where we're at now and where we're coming to. And when we come back to the father, that's where the celebration is. That's where the father's at. And that, that needs to be a, a motivator to us, not only for those of us in the situation as the prodigal son, but for those in the situation of maybe the older brother, uh, is not to focus on the evil deeds or the, the negative in people's life, but to look at where God's bringing them from and to, so that we, we don't somehow get angry with God or upset, but we rejoice. We need to rejoice. We should be a people who join with heaven. Uh, and I think for the most part as believers, we do that. We should do that, is when someone who's been a prodigal comes home, we need to celebrate with them. We need to rejoice with heaven that someone who was lost has been found. You know, it's easy to, to look at this through the lens of people who we have in our lives, whether it's family members or friends or neighbors or whoever it may be that we wish they would uh, come to Christ. But so many of us, how many of us have people out there that, and I'm just going to challenge us all, have people that, if we ever heard about them becoming a Christian, we would really struggle with that. We, we might find ourselves thinking, well, man, I, they need to pay for what they've done. They've done some evil things, and that's a whole other conversation that I don't know that I'm equipped to, to, to really work through tonight, but uh, that really challenges us, doesn't it? Well, it's, it's one thing to celebrate, oh, so-and-so got saved. Mm -hmm. But what if so-and-so's sins affected you? Mm -hmm. And in this case, that's obvious. The brother takes the offense. The older brother takes the offense of the younger brother personally. Yeah, he didn't just offend the father. He really offended his older brother too, and the whole family name and, and everything. So it's it's really a, a statement of forgiveness. And and the whole story really isn't about what you do. It's about who you are and being able to separate that. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's encouraging that reiterates that point that the older brothers inheritance just continues to grow when the father says everything i have is mm -hmm. yours amen and so i think it's what's amazing about this parable is it really preaches to both sides of the aisle it preaches to the one who has strayed and it preaches to the one who has not 
-hmm. and it gives a lesson to both. And so um, I think it's just one of the most powerful parables that Jesus taught. He taught many wonderful ones, but I think this one is so powerful because no matter who you are, it reaches you. And um, I don't know. I'm glad we had a chance Amen. to talk about Amen. it tonight. I am too. So we thank you all for joining us. Uh, before we leave, before I close out in prayer, uh, let me just uh, remind you that uh, this coming Sunday, uh, with the Phase 1 beginning actually this Friday, this coming Sunday, we will be having service at Kempsville Church. Yay! Yay. <laughs> so go ahead and hit some likes and loves if you want to, if you're excited about that. Now, we realize that we, we obviously, uh, we, we want to be cautious. We want to be careful and considerate. Uh, I would just add now that if you are in a situation health-wise where uh, it would be wiser for you to stay home, we encourage you to do that. If you feel like uh, you Take have a temperature yourself. or are sick in any way, we want you to stay home. Um, so, uh, but at the same time, we, in our being careful and considerate, we also want to gather. We, I think, uh, many of us have been eager to gather together in fellowship. We have missed that uh, fellowship uh, of the saints and worshiping together. So, uh, we have been busy this week. Yesterday, I spent time with the pastoral staff and. Uh, we've been going over the uh, requirements the governor has put out. Uh, we've also been preparing today as well. Uh, so uh, hopefully by this Friday, I'm going to do a video on Kempsville uh, Facebook page where I will basically give you a video walkthrough of what to expect this Sunday. Uh, Crystal, we're going to make sure we follow social distancing. Uh, we encourage you if you have a face mask and you want to wear that, go ahead and bring your face mask and wear that. Uh, if you have hand sanitizer and you want to bring your hand sanitizer, you can. But we have hand sanitizer that will be on hand. The facility uh, will be thoroughly cleaned and sanitized. Uh, we will be, um, we've already marked the pews. Basically, you're going to find green strips of tape on the backs of the pews where we have uh, measured. I did that today with the help of uh, Chris and Brett. Uh, we measured out sections where we uh, can, there's, if you're a couple or a family, you can sit together. We encourage you to, you're allowed to sit together as a family, uh, immediate family, uh, but then uh, it will maintain the six foot social distancing guidelines. Uh, I think one of the emotional moments for me today was actually at the altar. Uh, I marked off uh, 10 different places with tape, but I put those, instead of making it an X or just a piece of tape, I put it in the form of a cross. Uh, where we'll even have, uh, we're accommodating, where if you want to just come to the altar and pray, uh, there'll be a cross there uh, for you uh, to join in prayer. So we're going to be worshiping together this coming Sunday. There will be uh, entrance and exit points. We'll be making sure we follow that protocol as well. So we're, we're basically we're making all kinds of preparations. Uh, those will be fully in place uh, before, well before this Sunday. So we can't wait. Uh, to, to see you all. Uh, so I see Sister Carrie is uh, asking us to pray for Noah and the Fire Academy. And, Ma and, and Madison. And Madison. So uh, mentally and physically. I would imagine he is mentally and physically having. That's a tough. Fire Academy is not supposed to be easy. <laughs> it's supposed to be tough. So we'll pray for Noah. He's going to make he's He's from good stock, Sister Carrie. So we're believing he's going to do well, but we'll definitely remember him in prayer and Madison as well. And if any ever, anybody else has a prayer request, go ahead and share that very quickly with us right now. We'll be sure to pray with you. Uh, and uh, But again, we, we are excited. Uh, we hope you'll, we, we want you to basically this Sunday, I would say this. If you feel comfortable and you want to come out, you please come on out and join us in worship. If you don't feel comfortable yet, please understand, we understand we, we, would, we would never ask you to uh, go out of your comfort level. So let's pray together, and then uh, we'll close out our night together. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. Lord, as we have reflected tonight on the story yes, of the prodigal son, yes, God, God, we find ourselves connecting with the prodigal and what he felt, experienced. Lord, we find ourselves connecting with the father. We find ourselves connecting with the older son and what he experienced. God, wherever in life we are, whether we're in the situation of the prodigal son that's lost, maybe someone is 
actually viewed this tonight, God, who is in a prodigal place in life. God, they've taken uh, and they squander their life and they feel like, God, there's no hope. They feel like there's no chance of redemption. God, I just pray for them. We, we pray for them specifically right now that God, no matter where they are, help them to realize tonight that, Lord, they can come back. They can, they can get up from that place in life they are right now and and come back into a, a right relationship with you. And you're yes, already Lord. looking for them. Yes, you're Lord. already desiring to see them get up from that place and come back to you. Yes, Lord. You're ready to receive them with open arms. And you're ready to cover them with the cloak of your son, Jesus Christ. And you're ready to restore that right signet ring upon their life, God, that restores the authority and the relationship that you intend for them to have with you. Yes, Lord. Father, you're ready right now to put sandals back on their feet, God, in ministry and service. Lord, we also pray for those, God, who are with us today, God, their family members. We pray. We lift up Noah and uh, Madison as well, who uh, both are going uh, through fire training in the academy. God, we pray that mentally and physically and emotionally and psychologically, that, Lord, you would just give them strength and sustenance. God, to give them favor each and every day. And we are just confident that, uh, Lord, your spirit is with them and you're going to help them. Yes, God. God, we lift up all of our family members, our our uh, our church family members and our, our immediate family members. God, our, our, we ask you to continue to touch. Uh, Lord, as we continue to live each and every day, help us to live it to the fullest. Help us to stay close in our relationship with you. Yes, God. We lift up everyone, God, who is on the front lines do you continue to protect them and yes, strengthen them and help them? And God, as we get ready to prepare and worship together this Sunday, we just pray your continued favor. The Lord, you would help us, uh, Lord, to make all the necessary preparations. And the Lord, when we gather together this Sunday, God, not only those who are uh, with us physically there in the facility, but those who will be joining as well at the 2.30 service online. The Holy Spirit, as you have been so gracious to do each and every time we gather, that, Lord, there will be a special presence of your anointing tangibly yes, felt God. and experienced. Yes. Lord. So we thank you and for everyone who's joined us and with us right now. And we pray for their families and we pray for those who will be joining later and maybe viewing this later, that you would indeed help and bless them as well. Lord, continue to move in our hearts and lives, we pray and believe in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen and amen. So thank you all. And uh, we appreciate uh, you joining us tonight. Sister Crystal, anything you want to share or add? We good? Yeah, we're just looking forward to seeing everyone. Yep. <laughs> going to be a good, good day. We're looking forward to it. So thank you all for joining us. We look forward, Lord willing, to seeing you this Sunday. Yes. Whether it's at 1030 a.m. or on Facebook and YouTube, it will be at 2.30 p.m. So thank you all. God bless you. You have a wonderful and blessed rest of the week. Thank you. Bye. Bye.